everyone. Today we are going to present the work of Frank Ackerman and Lisa Hazelin in 2002, Pricing the Priceless, Cost Benefit Analyze of Environmental Production. This paper is discussing the mechanism of cost benefit analyze, reviewing the fundamental flaws of such analysts, and identifying some other alternatives that would help in analyzing the environmental friendly policies and regulations. There are a lot of previous studies used the analytical approach in both some consideration of causes and benefits to set the environmental standards, but the uses of cost benefits analyzed still remain controversial in some sense. It's a perfectly conventional cost benefit analyze. A scholar called Viscusi, who is a professor of law and economics at Harvard, suggested that cigarette smoking should be subsidized rather than taxed. And this assumption was consistent with the empirical data because there was another scholar called author found the smoking was actually mitigating the financial stress of the countries that having a aging population problem. Encouraging citizens to smoke can reduce the government's expenditures on pensions, housing, and health care. And this conclusion of perfectly conventional cost benefits definitely contradicts with our moral standards. So now we move to the section called dollars and discounting. It's hard for government to evaluate if the new proposed project is worth to do because the government is not like a company. There is no single quantitative objective for the public sector comparable to profit maximization for businesses. So they need to use cost benefit analysis to set an economic standard for measuring the success of the government's projects and programs. So there are three steps to perform the cost benefit analysis. The first step is to calculate the cost of a public policy. Um, it seems quite hard to calculate the cost of a policy accurately in practice, but at least it could be roughly estimated through research into available technologies and business strategies. And the consideration of the costs of environmental protection is not unique to cost benefit analysis, because every time when the government tends to develop a environmental regulation, they always need to consider the cost. However, what is unique to cost benefit analysis is the monetary valuation of the benefits of life, health, and nature itself. And after estimating the costs of implementing a public policy, usually the next step is to calculate the benefits. But in reality, there are no natural presses for a healthy environment. Therefore, cost-benefit analysis requires the creation of artificial presses. By uh, studying what people would like to pay for um, economies, set artificial prices for health and environmental benefits. One popular method is called contingent valuation. Directly ask people how much they are willing to pay to protect things they can't buy from a store. The other method of creating prices infers what people would like to pay from um, observation of their behavior in other markets. And what is the importance of pricing creating to life and the environment? It can derive the real value of avoiding a risk of death. And this is also the most important thing of studying environmental regulations. So the final step is discounting the future. Since cost and benefits of a policy often occur at different times, Usually, costs will occur in the near future to prevent harm in the more remote future. Therefore, future costs and benefits will be discounted and treated as equivalent to smaller amounts of money, today's dollars. For example, at a 3% um, discount rate, $100 20 years from now has a present value of only $55.
This is called discounting. In cost-benefit analysis, the government could estimate the present value of the future harms in order to take actions to prevent them. Before we describe the problems with the cost-benefit analysis, I'm going to talk about the two advantages in favor of this type of analysis. From the perspective of economics, this analysis could obtain better regulatory results because regulations are only adopted when benefits exceed costs and will yield the greatest net benefits. Thus, policymakers would focus on increasing efficiency, that is, getting the most desirable results from the least resources. One of the famous concepts should be statistical murder theorem proposed by John Graham. From his view, cost-benefit analysis keeps the balance between the money saver and the life saver. From a political point of view, cost-benefit analysis would produce a better regulatory process. One is more objective and more transparent, and thus more accountable to the public. It aims not only to constrain the agency discretion, but also to guarantee the transparency of a administrative procedures, making the public to be part of the process of decision-making about the environment is the key to apply the cost-benefits analysis. So now we come to the important part of this paper, and it's called Fundamental Flaws of Cost-Benefit Analysis. The cost-benefit analysis translates present things into dollars and discount future benefits. This is inconsistent with the way many people view the world. And there are some fundamental flaws of cost-benefit analysis because some characteristics of it are contrary to general knowledge. So basically, there are four fundamental flaws of cost-benefit analysis. And the first one is that the standard economic appro approaches to valuation are inaccurate and implausible. Recall the cost-benefit analysis requires the creation of artificial prices for all relevant health and environmental impacts. This quantitative precession comes at the expense of accuracy and common sense. So human life is the example of a value is not a com commodity and does not have a price because it's impossible to pay a set price to buy the right to kill someone. The price of a person's life should be infinite. And the upshot is that cost-benefit analysis is inherently unreliable. Besides, in practice, analysts often ignore the distinction between valuing risk and valuing life. A complete cost-benefit analysis should include valuation of both of those uh, benefits. But in fact, the analysts only calculate a value of statistical life and ignore life itself. They have blurred the line between risks and actual deaths. By calculating the value of reduced risk while pretending that they have produced the valuation of life itself. And another large problem with the standard approach to valuation of life is that it asks individuals only about their attitude towards risks to themselves. Because people care about others and they are not able to quantify the existence value of the life. Uh, of a stranger or a friend. So the value of lives cannot be deduced from someone's attitude towards risks to itself. In addition, since cost-benefit analysis relies on estimates of individuals' preference as consumers, it fails to address the collective choice pre presented to society. However, policies that protect the environment are often public goods and are not available for purchase in individual portions. And it's often impossible to arrive at a meaningful social valuation by adding up the willingness to pay by individuals. Also, numbers don't tell, don't tell us everything. For ultimate values such as life and death, 
the social context is decisive in our evaluation of risks. Cost-benefit analysis assumes the existence of generic risk and thereby ignore the contextual information that determines the manner in which many people think about real risks to real people. And finally, the economic valuation call for by cost-benefit analysis is fundamentally flawed because it demands an enormous volume of consistently updated information, which is beyond the practical capacity of our society to generate. The most important reason for implementing environmental protection is to protect the future generation, instead of just contributing to our generation. It includes avoiding the extinction of endangered species, maintaining the normal operation of ecosystems, and reducing persistent chemicals, and so on. According to above context, cost-benefit analysis downgrades the importance of the future in two ways through the technique of discounting and through predictive methodologies and take inadequate account of the possibilities of catastrophic and irreversible events. It travelized the future in four different ways. The first question, do future generations count based on the later is better argument? In that case, virtually everyone would prefer dying or falling ill later to dying or falling ill now. But the time periods involved in protecting the environment are often more than decades, which will make the discounting at any positive risk seems trivial even in global catastrophes. Here is an example. At a discount rate of 5%, the death of a billion people 500 years ago becomes less serious than the death of one person today. The second question will be, does haste prevent waste? Normally, the justification for discounting often assumes that environmental problems will not get any worse if we wait to address them. But the fact is, if we have been waiting for the technological innovation to solve environmental problems without taking any measures, the cost of mitigating environmental problems in the future will be higher and even lead to irreversible changes. The third question is begging the question. Most studies now discount future environmental benefits by at least 5% per year. This has little effect on the evaluation of programs since the benefits are assumed to occur in the future when deaths are awaited, rather than in the near term when risks are reduced. The last repressed question appears when discounting illustrates the failure of taking the difference between citizens and consumers into account. Thus, private preferences for current over future consumption should not be used to support public judgments that future harms are as important as immediate ones. Next, we're going to talk about the third fundamental defect of cost-benefits analysis. It tends to reinforce the patterns of economic and social inequality. Cost-benefits analysis adds up all the costs and benefits of a policy without dealing with the equity and distribution of resources questions. When benefits can be measured by willingness to pay for environmental improvement, the rich are able and willing to pay for more than the poor. This can lead to shifts of the most environmental burdens that will end up being imposed on those who with the least resources. Therefore, when formulating public policies, equity should be considered instead of just relying on cost-benefits framework. The fourth fundamental flaw of cost-benefit analysis is that the current analysts were unable to deliver on the promise of more objective and more transparent decision-making. Since the mechanism of cost-benefit analysis is treating each individual as a consumer instead of a citizen with a sense of moral responsibility to the large society, consumers will have a distinct and highly contestable worldview which may affect the objectiveness of decision-making process. Also, with pricing both advantages and disadvantages of various regulation policies, the actual use of cost-benefit analysis will be in favor of 
the people or communities with more wealth or having more political social influences, which will further undermine the claim that cost-benefit analysis is objective. The reason for the failure of being transparent is due to its complex, resource-intensive, and expert-driven process. Using the cost-analyze approach would demand a great deal of time and effort for a simple evaluation, and because it is expert-driven, there is also a greater opportunity for the experts intentionally or unintentionally to select their interest of the communities or some of its members. After revealing the flaws that have a cost-benefit analyze has, I will also show you guys the challenges of using the cost-benefit analyze in a real-life scenario. The first challenge is the limits of quantification. Since cost-benefit analyze generally pays more attention on the quantifiable benefits first and ignores other non-quantified benefits, using the cost-benefit approach may result in that the analyze includes no quantifiable benefits or causes. Also, the quantifiable benefits are not as many as we expected. For many environmental regulations, only the prevention of cancer deaths can be quantified. The result of incomplete cost-benefit analyze will skew the decision-making process, and besides the missing numbers from unquantifiable benefits, the quantified Benefit also suffers from the problem of heavily discounting. It is because the analyze does not have much quantified variables, and these problems will make the benefits of preventive regulations seem trivial. The second challenge of using cost benefit analyze is ignoring what cannot be counted, since the quantified or unquantifiable benefits is omitted from the cost-benefit analyze, the importance of those excluded benefits will not be able to engage or provoke public discussion. It happened to the proposal of Clinton administration's EPA in strengthening the standard for arsenic in drinking water. EPA cited a lot of human illness that could be prevented by the stricter standard in drinking water, but this illness cannot be expressed in numerical terms, so public discussion merely focused on the numerical terms of MLIs and ignored the cases of avoided illness that could not be quantified. And the third challenge of using cost-benefit analyze is that there is a tendency to overestimate the cost of regulations in advance of the implementation. It is due to that government would try to encourage new technologies and more efficient ways of doing business. So the market price of new technologies was not settled at the very beginning, and firms did not did have the incentive to overstate their cost of adapting to the new technologies. The example of 1990 Clean Air Act amendments experienced this problem before. The industry anticipated the cost of sulfur reduction would be 1,500 per ton, but the actual cost was under 150 per ton. So there, are, these three problems are making the cost-benefit analyze a less reliable or convincing approach to analyze the policies or regulations. The one-size-fits-all approach to regulation cost-benefit analyze cannot vary as the social context varies. So there were some new inventories of uh, regulation introduced. The first one is technology based regulation, which avoids massive research effort needed to quantifying and monetizing the harms of pollution. It directly proceeds to control emission with what we can do the best to mitigate the pollution that we think is harmful. The second alternative approach is performance-based regulation, which is to tell firms to clean up the certain extent, but not telling them precisely how to do it. The third approach is pollution trading, which was created for the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. This approach was to fix the supply of permits, set the cap on total emissions. The trading process would allow industry to decide where and how it is the most efficient way to reduce emission to fits under the cap. 
And the last alternative approach is informational regulation, which allows citizens and consumers not only to know about the risks they are facing from exposure to chemicals, but also empower them to do something about those risks. This eventually did bring a terrific success for many regulatory programs without considerations of cost benefit analyze. In all this paper concludes that the uh, distinctions between cost benefit analyze and other approaches are the translations of life, health, and the natural environment into monetary terms, and the discounting of harms to health, human health and the environment that are expected to occur in the future. These distinctions result in an intrinsic conflict between cost benefit analysis and the principles of fairness. National policy is aiming to protect people from being hurt by other people, and cost benefit analysis cannot simply be given some weight along with other factors without undermining the fundamental quality of all citizens. So cost-benefit analysis cannot overcome its fundamental flaws, and without consideration of cost-benefit analysis, may actually be able to bring us a better public policy decision. Thank you for listening, and have a good week.